Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for waiting and uh, good afternoon and welcome to ASPE for a launch, uh, the launch of uh, John Coyne's um, Securing the Frontiers report. Um, and I'm particularly pleased to uh, welcome uh, Minister Peter Dutton and Michael Pozzolo, uh, Secretary of uh, the Department, uh, and Michael Outram, uh, Deputy Commissioner of Operations for the Australian Border Force. Now, the Minister in particular is on a particularly tight time frame. I understand he's got um, some 30 minutes, um, not, not 35, not 25 minutes that he can uh, spare with us before he has to get back to uh, the Parliament. So what I'm going to do is to uh, introduce our three guest speakers who will make some uh, brief introductory remarks about uh, uh, the, the monograph publication um, and also about the um, uh, border security program um, and indeed anything that they may wish to say on, uh, on border security. Uh, and so our first speaker is going to be uh, uh, the Honourable Peter Dutton MP, Minister for Immigration and uh, Border Protection. Um, then we'll hear from uh, uh, Mike, who will have some comments, um, and then from uh, Michael Outram. Um, and uh, Minister, I guess when, when you um, have to move because of time constraints, we'll understand that you need to, uh, you need to take your leave. So uh, without further ado, can you please welcome the Minister to the microphone. Well, Peter, uh, thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Again, uh, my apologies. I've got uh, a whip who's being particularly difficult this afternoon, so I've got to get back up uh, to the house fairly quickly. But it's a great privilege and uh, pleasure to be here for the launch of uh, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute's uh, Border Security Program and its special report, Securing the Australian Frontier. I want to congratulate uh, ASPE and the Department for establishing a collaborative working relationship under an MOU entered into in April of this year. In particular, I want to say thank you very much uh, to Peter Jennings, the Executive Director of ASPE, uh, to Dr John Coyne, Senior Analyst for the Border Security Program and author of the special report, to the Secretary of uh, by Department, uh, Michael Pizzullo, and to the Commissioner of Australian Border Force, Roman Quadlick, to all of the staff within the Department's Policy Research and Statistics Branch. The establishment of ASPE's Border Security Program is, of course, very timely. The era in which we live has given rise to complex and multi-dimensional border security challenges as we've never known before. Today, an increasing number of people are on the move, migrating through both regular and irregular channels, more than any other time since the, world, since the Second World War. According to the IOM, today, more than one billion people in a global population of seven billion people are migrants. Of these, 250 million migrate internationally, and at least 700 million people would prefer to live somewhere else, according to Gallup polling. Having just visited Jordan and Lebanon, I understand firsthand the desire to move. But we can't succumb to the misguided altruism that led to the collapse of our own borders and the chaos that saw 50,000 people arrive here illegally by boat. By stopping the boats, the government has restored public confidence in our borders and in our migration program. Indeed, Scanlon Foundation report shows us that support for immigration in Australia has moved higher under the coalition. This restoration in confidence is fundamental to our nation's future prosperity, which relies on the legal movement of goods and peoples across borders. Within the Australian context, we predict that international air and sea passengers will increase 19% to 40 million by 2016-17, and that by 2017-18, mail from overseas will increase by 14%, sea cargo by 22%, and air cargo by more than 50%. The increasing movement of people and goods across borders brings with it an array of border security challenges, illicit trade, organised crime, unlawful or irregular movement, identity fraud, human trafficking, terrorism, and the departure and return of foreign fighters. Enhancements such as smart gates and biometric screening methods enhance security whilst improving passenger flows. Our counter-terrorism unit officers at the airports target radicalised youth venturing to conflict zones, renewed investment in cargo screening, an additional $88 million, has increased drug detections by one third. So the challenges are with us, but they only get more complex into the future. Nowadays, national security and border management 
are inextricably linked with international security and international border management. As such, Australia's national security, our economic prosperity and our social wellbeing are contingent on our ability to successfully manage the border continuum. In promoting a more sophisticated understanding of the border continuum and its challenges, we must include in it the ways in which we enhance border security for the benefit of our country. And I welcome the launch of ASPE's border security program for that reason. We value the independent and non-partisan research and analysis which ASPE will produce under this program. It will be a valuable resource to help inform the Australian Government's policy and operational deliberations. The ASPE special report securing the Australian frontier makes for fascinating reading. The report encourages us to think about the con construct of the modern day border, to consider it beyond being something physical or purely as a vehicle for enforcing <coughs> territoriality and exclusion, and appreciate how borders have changed over time and are now seen as a complex combination of connections and functions. We must operate in an environment which is increasingly complex, but we must optimise both the facilitation and compliance aspects of the border if it is to benefit and not hinder our nation's prosperity and security. In this respect, ASPE's report makes an insightful contribution to the complexities and workings of the border continuum. I very much look forward to seeing the research uh, which will be produced from the Border Security Program and other initiatives uh, which will stem from ASPE and the Department's close collaboration. Thank you very much. Well, Minister, thank you for your words uh, and in particular for your support of ASPE. It's, it's much appreciated and uh, it's no exaggeration to say that we literally couldn't uh, do this without that support. Uh, contestability of uh, policy advice is a tricky thing, ladies and gentlemen, but it, I think it is important to producing the best quality policy outcomes uh, that government can produce, which is why ASPE's here. That's why we were founded some 15 years ago and continue to uh, 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 mine that seam. Uh, now, can you please welcome Michael Puzzillo, the Secretary of the Department. Uh, thank you, uh, Peter and uh, Minister. Uh, uh, great to share uh, this uh, podium with you. Uh, to uh, friends and colleagues here, to uh, Senior Analyst Coyne, I uh, very much look forward to hearing your remarks in a moment. Con uh, congratulations on the special report that we're about to launch. To my Departmental and Border Force colleagues, the Deputy Commissioner, um, uh, Michael Outra, I might notice uh, Deputy Secretary Fernandez is here and uh, General Bottrell, Commander of JADF and other friends and colleagues, many of whom uh, I recognise and know in the, in the room. Uh, can I just elaborate on a couple of points? The Minister's uh, covered the ground very comprehensively. Uh, when Peter and I started uh, to engage on this uh, uh, subject uh, in the latter part of 2014, we, re we really thought there was a, uh, a gap in the policy and research space around a larger sense of strategy. Uh, ASPE and other uh, institutions, academic think tank and otherwise, had focused very traditionally on warfare, military power, statecraft, diplomacy, all very, very important matters. And both Peter and I, who of course have served as uh, Deputy Secretaries of Defence, appreciate and know that uh, very, very well uh, indeed. But we thought that a strategy is becoming a more elaborated uh, concept, and you see that around the world today for these very reasons. Nation states are under pressure, their borders are being uh, pressured. Uh, both in terms of how they responsively connect to a globalised world for the movement of people, goods, uh, and for the managed movement of labour and students and the like, for the managed movement of goods uh, that underpins the prosperity of our globalised economy, our ability to consume the goods that we want to uh, purchase at reasonable prices, uh, which are facilitated across borders, actually add to our prosperity. The responsiveness of migration systems that give us the targeted labour that we need that can't otherwise be filled by our domestic labour market is terribly important. Our ability to order goods uh, from uh, overseas suppliers and for, that, for those goods to have facilitated delivery often to our doors overnight is very, very important. We take these things for granted. But embedded in these very networks are the pathways and possibilities for illicit and indeed illegal uh, movement of goods and people, which also carries with it the risk of harm to our communities. So how you get the balance right between openness and engagement, and in a globalised uh, world you want that openness and engagement, otherwise you don't benefit from the, from the flutes, fruits I'm sorry, of a globalised world, but you also want to protect the community from harm, uh, be it in terms of the movement of people or the movement of goods. So we thought that uh, setting up a collaborative uh, program, which we're delighted to 
uh, also recognise uh, tonight, Peter, in terms of a three-year engagement between the department, uh, which includes as its uh, enforcement arm the Australian Border Force, uh, and ASPE over a three-year period will give us the time, resources and space to do some targeted research, independent research, not which the department certainly won't seek to uh, influence or in any way editorially control, because we want there to be openness, we want there to be contestability, we want there to be a contest of ideas uh, and a particular, uh, a particular emphasis on evidence and looking at the evidence and seeing where that evidence uh, leads you. So we are absolutely delighted to be in partnership with ASPE. Uh, we're delighted, and again, Minister, if I can thank you for attending in a very busy parliamentary day to recognise the importance of the commencement of this research program. I think the special report that and we're just about to hear from uh, John really lays out a very rich agenda that we can now uh, begin to explore. And obviously, uh, the researchers who are brought onto this uh, job, uh, in addition to John, uh, the academics and others who will be involved, really have got a rich menu uh, to uh, select from, to work through over the next uh, three years and the department and indeed the Border Force very much look forward to that collaboration. Thank you, Peter. Michael, thank you and thank you for your leadership in helping to make this a reality in terms of uh, the support for the, uh, for the program. Uh, and now please uh, welcome Michael Outram, Deputy Commissioner of uh, Operations from Australian Border Force. Michael. Thank you, Peter. Minister Dutton, Secretary Pazillo, friends and colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm um, representing Roman Kovlig, of course, the Commissioner who sends his apologies. Unfortunately, he can't be here tonight. Um, and whilst ASPE is a relatively young organisation, of course, it has already developed a good reputation um, as one of the leading think tanks and contributions to the public discourse. Um, of course, it's important to continue to develop a sophisticated understanding uh, of Australia's strategic policy issues. Um, in a volatile global environment and of course from my point of view it's also important to be able to apply those uh, learnings in an operational context um, and to an operational agency. Of course the Border Force Act established the ABF um, very recently on the 1st of July as the operational enforcement arm within the Department of Immigration and Border Protection. Uh, in essence what we're doing is combining the functions of what was previously uh, Customs and Border Protection uh, with detention operations and field compliance from what was the Department of Immigration. Um, the Commission of the Border Force, of course, reports to the Minister uh, directly on operational matters. Um, but unquestionably, the Border Force's operational activities are incredibly and increasingly diverse. And in order to uh, facilitate uh, that prosperity that the Secretary spoke about, uh, we have to work out who we can trust, which goods are benign, where we can accelerate the movement of people and goods, so that we can put our finite resources onto uh, more, more precision strikes, if you like, in an enforcement sense, in the areas of the highest threat. And so these sorts of collaborative exercises with ASPE are very valuable in that regard. Just as a statistical snapshot of some of the sort of work that we're involved in, on a weekly basis, we clear more than 600,000 air passengers and 22,000 sea passengers who are arriving into the country. And we have to work out of those which ones we want to intervene with and which ones we want to facilitate the movement of. We clear more than 600,000 imported air cargo consignments, 55,000 imported sea cargo consignments, and of course, with, the, with all the trade and the, the, the benefits that, that those goods bring to our country, of course, with it hidden within some of them, uh, there's a few uh, illicit goods that we need to be um, alive to. And this brings into, of course, point the, the importance of our, of our intelligence and targeting operations. Uh, drugs are, of course, a key issue for us, and um, we made more than 32,000 drug detections um, of last year, of which more than 14,000 were major illicit drugs. Uh, and the snapshot goes on. But importantly, we're, of course, we're having to work increasingly with other partners um, across the spectrum, whether it's New South Wales um, Task Force uh, Polaris on the waterfront, um, or other operations when dealing with tobacco, illicit firearms, and, and the list, again, goes on. Um, so my reason for providing that brief overview of our operational remit is that ASPE's research has the potential to illuminate and contextualise these vulnerabilities at the border. So it's a, with pleasure that I uh, commend the report, John. Thank you very much for that, and I look forward to your words. Thank you. Thanks very much, Michael. And in fact, if you look at the um, photograph on the inside cover of the publication, you'll see a rather alarming consignment of, uh, I think, liquid methamphetamine, which was brought into the country. Thank you, Minister. Much appreciated.
Um, I, I must admit, when I initially saw the photo, I thought it looked like the latest palette load of cosmetics that my wife uh, orders from uh, overseas, but, but no. Uh, um, and that just reflects the challenge, I guess, of being able to uh, uh, know which can come through and, and, and which uh, must be held back. Now, uh, the other point to make about um, ASPE is that uh, we are, in many respects, a, a public-private partnership. We, we work hard to bring in the support of private entities to undertake work with us in the defence world because um, industry is indeed a, a critical enabler of uh, capability within the department and so that's a, a perspective that needs to be listened to. Um, uh, and so uh, uh, in this area um, I'm very pleased to be able to thank Mr Will Taylor who is the uh, General Manager of Government Technology and Industry for Kinetic in Australia um, as a supporter of the launch event this evening. Um, it's, uh, it's great to, to have you here Will. I, I see the, the motto of the Kinetic company, people who know how and uh, when I think who falls into that category, Will is definitely uh, amongst them. Uh, he would be known to many people here as uh, a former um, defence attaché of the um, uh, UK uh, High Commission. Uh, but it's great to see that you stayed on to spend a bit of time representing Kinetic. So Will will um, introduce John, who will then give us some um, uh, uh, ex extracted highlights of, uh, of his report and then we'll go into Q&A after John's comments. And Mike has uh, kindly um, uh, agreed to make himself available to, uh, to take some questions as well. So that's the format for uh, the rest of uh, the afternoon. And with that, can you please welcome Will Taylor. Thanks, Peter. I did more than stay on. I um, stayed on to test the immigration system by immigrating, and I can tell you that it worked. Um, it falls to me firstly to thank ASPE uh, as the representative of Kinetic Australia for the opportunity to sponsor this event um, and I think it's important that th there's probably a second thing I need to do and that's for those um, who are confused. It probably cost millions of pounds and a clever consultant to come up with the name Kinetic and there really is no cue in it. Um, legend has it that there are two things in life that are certain. Um, I'd venture to add that there's a third, and that is I'm certain that none of you came here to listen to me to speak. So, John Coyne, background in Army Intelligence, uh, PhD in Transnational Organised Crime, extensive experience in national security, mm -hmm. counter-terrorism, law enforcement, at home and with ASEAN partners. Joined ASPE in February of this year and is the author of Securing the Australian Frontier. John. Thank you, Will. Uh, good evening, Secretary, um, Deputy Commissioner, um, Dep Sex, ladies and gentlemen, and I'll leave it at that because there are so many different titles in this room this evening. Um, being the last speaker of a night and is always difficult because you're planning and trying to work out what it is exactly that the three people before you will say and how much of the limelight they'll take away from being able to quote wonderful fingers. Um, so. On that note, um, I have to be honest, it's a difficult proposition standing up in front of here, but it's no more difficult than the role of a think tank. Um, early in the piece, when I first came to Aspel, just before I came here, Peter Jennings said to me that, um, he goes, oh, you know, it's not an academic position, John. You don't get to sit in your office um, and research and come out occasionally. Um, and there's quite a few different paths, but tonight's the truth of that as well. Um, it's a long path to nights like this, and a number of people in Aspie make that possible. But um, for those who are concerned about dialogue in the border security environment tonight, and the presence of um, the minister highlights that that is in fact changing, and the discussion itself is changing. As the border security program director, and I say this because um, it sets the tone for the evening. My role is to generate new ideas for government, which is pretty hefty, and it comes straight out of our charter and to foster strategic border security expertise in Australia through dialogue, research and its contribution to the public debate. Um, pretty hefty words. I like to say when I meet with um, senior members of the public service and members of the department, um, we are luxurious here. Um, I'm all care and no responsibility. I'm the person who gets to think about the problems. Um, and I'd say the vast majority of the people within this room um, have the unenviable position of having to be the ones who make decisions and implement policy. 
and I commend you for that. Um, but separate from that, what I use that as a caveat for how I speak this evening. And I say a caveat because um, tonight I'm just going to keep to six key issues. Um, I generally, and those who who know me over my career, always try to keep to three because people can't remember it. Um, but the fact that it's six even highlights um, the problems that we face in trying to manage such a complex beastie as an Australian border. And I say that because um, when I first moved out of Defence and National Security, people said to me, they said, um, you're moving into law enforcement, why would you do that? I said, it's a complex prickly problem. And now people say to me, you're working on border security, why do you do that? Um, because it's an incredibly complex and prickly problem and I can't reduce it three, down to three key points for this evening, despite uh, my boss saying I had to. Um, my first point they want to raise is how the concept of the border is changing. Now, um, that seems fairly esoteric and hardly applied policy, but it has a realistic impact on, the, on how policy in this country is going to be developed into the future. A nation's national security has always played a crucial role in a country's health, wealth, security and cohesion. And I use each of those words very deliberately. Peace and prosperity in the days of the Roman Empire depended on the defence of the frontiers. It was the frontiers which gave the empire security, but more importantly, allowed economies to flourish and provide taxes. Now, I promise you that is the only piece of academic history that I will give throughout this evening. And I just like it, but the case remains today. Importantly for both domestic and national security, the border is a space in which government can control what enters this nation um, our sovereign territory, and to what degree and under what preconditions and constraints. But the traditional ways in which borders have been conceptualised are challenged by an increasingly globalised, connected and independent world. Uh, for those of you who have been around in Canberra and academic lands, those are lovely cliched terms. But analysis of Australia's practical application of sovereignty through legitimate power fails to actually provide a definitive, universal, single point that is the border now. Instead, it reveals an almost amorphous environment in which the border is often elastic, virtually, virtual and indeed legally, socially and psychologically constructed. And all of these things have day-to-day -day impacts on our lives. But all of this doesn't mean that the border as a concept is redundant. The border is itself now a more complex construct comprised of a combination of connections, conditions and control measures. In our, and in our public policy, we must engage with this rich complexity and avoid being polarised on arguments around to secure or not to secure. The second point that I'd like to raise, put simply, um, is that there is not enough public policy dialogue in border security here in Australia. In contrast with traditional national security issues and border management, there's little or no public policy dialogue and research on border security. Sure, there's been a polarised debate on irregular migration, but this has not dealt with holistic border security. Already, through publications, dialogues, workshops with the executive members of, um, of the department, through engagement and events such as tonight, this is changing, and this should give us heart. ASPE is also pleased to introduce this new border security program to address the, sh address the shortfall. The third point I'd like to raise is that the threats at our border security, or to our border security, are increasing in diversity, and there are indeed difficult times ahead. By this I mean that there are threats from transnational serious organised crime syndicates, people smugglers, human traffickers, from espionage, illicit drugs, firearms importers, terrorists, and the list goes on. And now unfortunately, and much often not admitted, we've also become an exporter of organised crime and terrorism, which places additional pressure on our border security resources. The broader security risks are further broadened by issues such as counter-proliferation, biohazards and trade-based money laundering. Many of these threats are interconnected and require sophisticated responses that are equally committed to creating a strong economy and a cohesive society as to undertaking enforcement and regulatory compliance. We'll add that analysing Australia's border security threats coherently is a complex and difficult task. By assessing only those things that we detect in the border, we assume that it's somehow a representative sample of the overall threat. But we're only to look at the increasing seizures of drugs that cross our border, 
to quickly realise that whilst they remain easy to very easy to get, while their prices remain stable, we're seizing more drugs than ever before. And I also draw your attention to an additional source of pressure. Um, as recently as May this year in discussions in Malaysia, there's a growing awareness across Southeast Asia and the ASEAN member states that there's a period of resource scarcity fast approaching. And the very front line of that resource scarcity involves our fisheries. And as such, we are entering a new age where border security will increasingly be focused on an old problem of protecting the sovereignty of our resources from those who would take them from us. My fourth point relates to a growing gap between the capacity of the ABF and the number of border tra transactions. I caveat this, that this is not a criticism of the department, but it's a reality of a changing world. As said earlier by the Minister and by the Secretary and by the Deputy Commissioner, is that the overall number of transactions, people, so over five million temporary visas granted every year, the number of freights, cargo ships arriving, pleasure craft, and the list goes on, is increasing at significant rates. However, the investment that we put into our border security agencies is not increasing at that same rate. So this requires a degree of innovation and technology in order to maintain that gap. Secondly, the introduction of the ABF and the Department of Immigration Border Protection is a major change in the machinations of government. And as a result of that, it will take a time and a period for it to fully mature. During that period between full maturation, we need to continue to examine the widening gap between border transactions and our capability. My fifth point rel relates to a need for a paradigm shift in border security strategy and thinking. Securing a borders, uh, sorry, securing a nation's border is, in an absolute sense, is no longer possible. The approach that the Roman Empire used, and I told lie, then I am using it a second time, to check every transaction that went across a border, um, those days are gone, and it's become a game of risk management. What that leaves us with, though, is a situation where we have to change the way we're thinking from checking transactions to targeting risk. And that requires a change also in the way that we summarise the question of border security. That means border security becomes more of a question of what residual risk are we willing to accept at our borders and in our society? And secondly, how can this residual risk be managed in an efficient and effective manner and within the budgets provided? The answer to that is continued investment in innovation and technology. And I use those words not as cliches, but in an open sentence and a challenge to development. Finally, and probably my most controversial point for this evening, and especially for my um, private sector colleagues and, and guests here tonight, is that I would like to highlight that the role of the private sector at the border needs to be re-examined. Two weeks ago, or oh, 10 days ago, um, the CEO of Qantas raised a question, and he raised a question in the ma Australia's major newspapers, and he said, how will, or sh how will the government and when will the government invest more money in border security to shorten the queues at Sydney and Melbourne International Airport? Now the question he probably should have asked with that is how can Qantas work with government to maintain border security and shorten the queues at Sydney and Melbourne's International Network Airport? The private sector is already playing an important partnership role in border management. The D Department of Immigration and Border Protection's Australian Trusted Trader Program is a standout example of how cooperation between the sectors can streamline and facilitate trade. But with increasing threats, the globalisation of value chains and the exponential growth in border transactions, it's an appropriate time that we re-examine the role of the private sector at the border. In closing, the provision of border security involves far more than creating a capability focused on keeping our borders secure from potential terrorists, irregular migrants and illicit contraband. Effective border security allows for the seamless, legitimate movement of people and goods across our borders, which is critical to enhancing trade, travel and migration. With continued increases in people, information 
commodities and value streaming across our borders. The ability to regulate these border flows in an absolute sense is declining. And hunting for potential threats, risks and harms at the border has become akin to a search for a needle in a perpetually expanding haystack. The diffuse and adaptive nature of border threats and risks ensures that border security in an absolute sense is more of an aspirational goal than an end state. The reality demands further public policy dialogue on what border security means in a practical sense. And at the top of the list of discussion topics is the search for a pragmatic description of what success looks like for our border security agencies. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've got time now for uh, maybe uh, 10 or a little uh, longer, 10, 15 minutes worth of questions. I might ask uh, Mike and John just to simply come to the podium. Um, when I was uh, in the Defence Department, uh, uh, one of the secretaries I worked for was, uh, was Rick Smith, and um, Rick used a phrase to refer to people who did things like refer to the Roman Empire in their speeches, um, who referred to them as 40-pound heads. <laughs> and um, I, I took that to be a compliment at the time, uh, thinking that what he was really meaning was people who thought deeply about uh, policy issues. Um, uh, and so, ladies and gentlemen, we have 80 pounds worth of um, uh, strategic thinking uh, here this evening, which we really shouldn't lose the opportunity to ask some questions of, uh, either Mike as uh, secretary or John as the author of this report. So let me throw it open to you. Uh, any, any questions from the Uh, but uh, maybe John would like to buy in on this too. It strikes me as an area that's not covered, and I haven't given this a great deal of thought because I thought of it while John was talking, but that's the area of quarantine as an example of border protection. Is there some sense that maybe that could be brought into the portfolio or into the uh, organisation to cover that? Uh, David, I, I think um, sometimes uh, these questions can be overly reduced to questions of organisational structure. Uh, whether you um, consider biosecurity in those terms or not, the fact of the matter is the ABF already has something like, I think it's up to 60-odd partner and client uh, uh, referring agencies. So a border force officer is trained to both using risk techniques, uh, visual observation, observing behaviours, look for all manner of matters. So if we just take that physical interaction, uh, even though John's report uh, very uh, tellingly talks about the border as a whole continuum. Let's just reduce it down to the physical observations that one makes at ports of entry. Um, uh, the Deputy Commissioner for Operations runs this on a 24-7 basis. They're looking for uh, uh, illicit goods, narcotics and the like. They're also looking for dangerous toys, things that are um, registered uh, not just in Commonwealth schemes but federal and territory, uh, state and territory schemes where there are arrangements in place with all manner of other jurisdictions. Therapeutic goods is another example. Um, the border force doesn't need to be, if you like, the, the policy, regulatory, legislating, strategic planning, operational and service delivery arm around therapeutic goods. It can work with the relevant authorities in the health portfolio to be on alert for the sorts of medicines that are going to harm our, our community. Uh, and so that's just one example, uh, product safety, uh, children's toys uh, uh, coming up to Christmas, very much a focus of attention. The Commonwealth, other than general consumer law, uh, doesn't have any specific remit in relation to product safety, the states and territories do. And yet there you have the Australian Border Force able to act as an agent on behalf of those other, not just Commonwealth agencies, but other jurisdictions. So uh, this question is often reduced and you sometimes see the commentary in the press to a question of organisational arrangements. I think the better starting point is look at what the functional arrangements are, look at what the sensible end-to-end -end processes are, in this case quarantine or biosecurity as it's more properly called and described these days, and then work out the operation, uh, the organisational uh, arrangements as a consequential feature of your analysis rather than as a starting point. Um, I saw an eyebrow flicker from David Rowe from the Financial Review. So. Thanks, Peter. Um, uh, Mike, John, thanks. My editors will want me to ask about Christmas Island, Mike, and uh, I'm going to um, defy them and uh, d just don't tell them that I, uh, I squibbed on this one. I'm curious well, about John's... Well, he talked about the Roman Empire, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I, I'm interested in your response to John's remark about um, whether your capacity, whether the ABS capacity can keep up with the workload that it, it's going to face over the next uh, few decades. Do you feel that you need more resources or can you do things smarter, for example, through technology? Uh, they're not, it's not a binary uh, question, in, indeed it's, it's incumbent upon um, everyone who works in this space and no different from the Chief of the Defence Force, the uh, head of a policing agency, the head of uh, hospital systems. I mean everyone is faced with the issue of volume because our societies expand, our populations expand, the nature of interactions expand. When societies are separated obviously there are fewer border uh, interactions. You can have the same population much more connected across the globe because of shipping, aviation, the internet and the like, and it lifts the intensity of contact. That's a good thing for the reasons discussed earlier. You can't possibly chase uh, volumes to say, for every one additional transaction, I need point X of an officer. That is uh, redundant thinking. Banks don't think like that, for instance, in terms of how to deal with uh, growing markets and uh, growing consumer appetite for financial services. What they're constantly thinking to do is how do we innovate our service delivery platforms, our systems, how do we use technology to, in some cases, let's just take that example of banking, to stream our customers, those who are tech savvy, internet savvy, into digital, what they call digital channels. There are always going to be some streams where people have got disabilities, they don't have access to the internet, they, they've got special needs, okay, we can have some special consideration there. And in some other parts of financial services you have a more labour intensive approach because you're going to have a lot more face to face engagement. It's no different from running hospitals, it's no different from running a police force. Uh, and as much as I won't, uh, no secretary or no agency head will ever say no to more resources, uh, but it, again, uh, as with the answer to the previous question, it's the wrong starting point to the proposition because activity is always going to grow ahead of budget, and it doesn't matter w whether you're in the private sector or the public sector. Technical innovation, the adaptation of technology into your business processes, the constant retraining of your people, the streamlining of their business, the business processes that they employ is really the only solution. Now, once you've maxed out efficiency, once you've looked at all of the different ways to innovate, there's always going to be a question at the margin about physical capacity because in some cases it does come down to the uh, offices on the ground and you're always going to have to keep... Uh, that uh, the, the, the question of their coverage and their ability to apply coverage uh, in, uh, in frame, but you should never start with the question of just because my volumes are going up, therefore I need my resources to climb at the same rate. I think I might add with that, talking to, um, and interesting enough, when you talk to the senior bureaucrats across the, the department, when you start thinking about, and I always ask them, what does the department look like in five years' time? So, you know, tonight I'll talk about um, talking about travellers, okay, just at international airports, and I say, well, what will the traveller experience be in five years' time? And they say, well, you know, someone will arrive in Sydney Airport, um, the average traveller will walk down straight out, pick up their luggage and leave in five years, and it'll only be a very small, small percentage of people who will have anything to do with the Australian Border Force. And so when I'm talking about absolutes, it's how do we get there between those two. So I'd just like to acknowledge Richard Miles, the shadow spokesman, who's coming. Thank you, Richard. Uh, my, my question, Mike, is why am I the guy always selected for the explosives test? Are you able to... <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd be on some list or something. Uh, I, 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 I don't normally, li I don't normally uh, like to deflect in these circumstances, but you really need to speak to our colleagues at the Office of Transport Security, Peter. <laughs> All right, in that case, I'll go to uh, Toby Feakin, who I think had a better question than that one. Probably so. not. <laughs> Um, thank you. I had a couple in my mind, but I think the one I wanted to ask really was about, um, you know, the concept of the border. You were saying it's it's a very different concept to that which we perhaps had in the past. And Mike, I've heard you speak about that previously as well at other ASPI events. In in that regard, I wondered if you could talk about the internationalisation of the border and what you do overseas to protect the border. Because in, in essence, really, we're only as strong as our weakest link. And that weakest link is often points of entry into the border from those countries with less developed systems, um, uh, uh, understanding of, of immigration technologies and that kind of thing. So I wonder if perhaps both of you could comment on the international piece. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, can I also acknowledge the presence of the Shadow Minister, Mr. Mr. Miles? Uh, great to see you here. Um, uh, I might just take one example, but it speaks to the general principle. Um, in the last, uh, certainly the last generation, over the last couple of decades, especially since 9-11 and more particularly even so, more so in the more recent years, 
uh, border agencies, customs authorities, um, um, uh, immigration services have, start, have started much more consciously to interact. They're probably starting back away from security agencies, intelligence agencies, the level of collaboration, for instance, that armed forces have engaged in. In a sense, there's a more natural fit. I mean, if you're fighting a war in a coalition, you create alliance relationships and some of those uh, endure beyond uh, the war. Customs agencies, border agencies and immigration agencies have tended to start from a different point of origin. Um, sovereignty was initially seen as exclusionary. So if you're a customs service, and I'll use the one example that I uh, uh, intimated that I would, uh, to go to the trusted trader scheme that uh, John mentioned and it's covered in his report as one of the case studies, a customs authority uh, anywhere in the world, a quarter of a century ago, and it's been chipped away at, uh, particularly with the global trade agreements that have been entered into in the last 20 years, and Australia is now coming to this somewhat belatedly, but under this um, under authority from, from this government very strongly with the creation of the trusted trader scheme, the whole paradigm's been inverted. So traditionally a customs officer would say, this good has come from a foreign country. Well, funny that, because they're customs officers and by definition they're at ports of entry, and by definition everything's come from a foreign country. Because when we federated, uh, you know, we set up the customs boundary at the perimeter of the whole nation, got rid of all the customs houses that used to be between the, the colonies, and we faced out. So it's strange that um, you'd think after 115 years of repeatable processes, you'd think that goods coming from overseas are sent to us by foreigners. Um, well, if you then take that next step forward, you say, well, the people importing those goods knew that they were coming. Strangely enough, I know it's a bizarre uh, thought. Now, if they are at the higher end of the um, commercial chain, for instance, uh, large retailers, people who stock up before Christmas, for instance, they might even have uh, forward orders because, strangely enough, their bosses want to know how much their general managers are spending to import those goods. Strange, strange concept, I know. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you start to then work with industry in the same way, say, the ATO, which really led the way in Australia in terms of tax arrangements 20 plus years ago, including through the work done by my predecessor as the Chief Executive of Customs, Michael Carmody, when he was Tax Commissioner, you then take that logic to the next step, which is to say, well, OK, if you've got a sense of what your tax obligations are going to be, let's, let's enter into an account-based relationship. You forecast uh, what you think you're going to be uh, uh, undertaking in terms of economic activity and then we'll do an audit, we'll do a retrospective and we'll adjust the tax that you otherwise owe or are owed. Very simple concept. Um, the community of world customs organisations under the auspices of the world customs organisation which goes directly to your point about international uh, interaction, in the last 20 years and I said, as I said very bluntly because it's, it's um, just simply an empirical fact, Australia's come to this rather recently under the Trusted Trader Scheme, have said, well, hang on, if all of the importers know what's coming, then the jurisdiction sending the goods at ex as exports, they must know what they're sending. So if you start to create a web of transacting information, transacted information between customs authorities, you're going to, over time, be able to reconcile what the declared transactions are with what these accounts say that they're going to be. So to take examples, retailers stocking up before Christmas, they can anticipate the goods that are going to start coming in. Once you start to do that, you can then start to apply some risk judgments. The, uh, one of the central theses uh, in John's paper to say, OK, some of this activity we're going to have to look at on a random basis just to make sure that we sample and that we're not being spoofed. Other activity is going to have a degree of risk associated with it, so we might do some, more, some deeper um, examination of it and indeed pull uh, those goods off the wharves as they come in. And in other cases, because we've got actual leads based on intelligence collaboration, they are very high priorities and we are going to attack those consignments because there's a very high probability, for instance, uh, that uh, narcotics are contained in those containers. So once you start to segment the flows, you can start to break up those huge numbers and the volumes that were mentioned both by the Minister, John, and others earlier and start to take a much more differentiated approach. But critical and intrinsic to that whole approach to trust a trader is international collaboration. Uh, and it, it, it is based on a supply chain model. Supply chains are the very, um, are the very central feature of global trade, and now border and customs agencies are really starting to collaborate together to exploit the features of those supply chains to both facilitate the flow of goods and to protect the community at the same time.
And Toby, I might just um, provide a more practical, I guess, example of where, um, when I say practical, it, these processes are slowly being put into place. Um, OpCobra is a multinational operation which has run for the last three years out of Thailand, um, targeting, um, targeting the illicit movement of wildlife timber. Uh, involves this year some 71 nations, um, and a lot of those nations are nations that um, have particular problems with um, transparency at borders. Um, and we're seeing, in a very practical sense, through the assistance of um, law enforcement, but just as importantly WCO, um, the transfer of um, the transfer of intelligence and information backwards and forwards. And in a very, when I say practical example, in a very practical sense, working through. Um, the independent in challenges of exchanging information that has commercial value, um, that has, you know, it provides and deals with the nation's security from an economic sense. Um, and certainly in some of these places, I saw it firsthand between um, Laos and Thailand, uh, between Laos, Cambodia, Cambodia, Thailand. Um, you know, these relationships are slowly building. Um, and it's where, and it is mentioned within the report, it's where capacity development plays a vital role now in border security um, and about working with our partners offshore. Uh, now, I think I'll just make one last question because I know Mike has a meeting up in Parliament to go to, so it'll be good to Thanks, uh, This question's uh, in particular to uh, John Coyne, but uh, Secretary, if you'd like to join in later on. Uh, and it's a bit of a change, I guess, in step. And it focuses on one of the points that you raised, John, in your, uh, in your opening remarks, and that relates to, uh, to resource security. Uh, in particular, what sort of, uh, what sort of uh, challenges we face into the future, particularly as, uh, as resources are becoming uh, increasingly um, uh, competitive in their, uh, in, their, in their approach from various, uh, various countries. So this would obviously, from a, from a construct of a border security and a frontier uh, security point of view, would require a very important understanding of what the quotient of the, of the various resources that, uh, that we have in and around our, our Australian borders, not only the continental uh, borders but also our external territories in particular, I'm thinking of the Antarctic territories, but there are, as you know, there are many, many other external territories that, uh, that extend beyond the 200 nautical mile zone and also uh, the subterranean uh, and sub submarine uh, continental shelf extensions. How do, you, how do you see the challenges of those, uh, of those resource security um, aspects of the frontier conundrum uh, going forward into the future and what roles do you see for various other agencies beyond, I guess, the ABF? Um, look, I'll, I'll probably start by, um, it's got more to do with the, than just the resources in the sense that it's, it's how much people are willing to put value in those resources. And by that I mean, um, uh, there's a, there's a relatively rare timber called um, called redwood and um, it's located um, and it's a hardwood located in various places in Southeast Asia. Um, in the last 12 months about 240 people have been killed on the border of Cambodia and Thailand. Uh, it costs about a million dollars to have a US to have a bed made out of this material um, and people within China highly value it's highly valued. Um, so in this case, you know, a, a resource that is incredibly valuable but in very short supply, and when you think of it in a national sense like a single tree species, it sort of, um, it, it defies logic. So it, it's some of those sorts of conversations that we need to have, and I think it's early days yet. I'm not saying, and I'm certainly not ringing any alarm bells that, um, you know, our fisheries are in immediate danger. That being said, I mean, if you've just got to extrapolate out, if you have the issue of, of people willing to murder and kill 240 people in a 12-month period um, for a piece of timber, um, what else has value um, and to what extent people go to exploit that? Um, and when I said resource um, scarcity, I mean, it's, at the moment it's about, I think many ASEAN um, leaders and the conversations I had in Malaysia were very much around, um, there was, a, everyone knows academically that resources are finite, that you can't keep making them when it comes to natural resources. Um, however, I think that we found this situation, well they found this situation, that somewhere culturally they kept on exploiting it around a range of resources and all of a sudden there's a growing awareness in think tanks and in governments and certainly in Indonesia and Malaysia that that's, that's, they're entering a new period where those resources are scarce and fisheries becomes one of those. I think it's, 
I mean, I hate to use cliched words, but I think it's, it, you know, when we talk this time about border security, clearly it has more to do um, with a whole government approach and with actually sitting there and examining um, the threats and risks. And I know that seems like a very much like a bingo answer, but, um, you know, you have to, on each of those th- issues, so fisheries, you have to sit there and go through, uh, you know, an exact examination of the risk, the cost benefit, etc., cetera, um, and the th- current threats out there. And I think my point with that is that it's, it's, that situation is changing, and from a border security perspective, we need to be aware of that. Sorry, Secretary. Well, thank you. Um, uh, Nick, it's a great question. For Australia, it really comes down to maritime uh, border protection. Uh, we don't have the sort of land border issues that... Uh, that you find in Southeast Asia and elsewhere. Uh, in contrast to the uh, rather immature uh, approach, although it's changing rapidly, that I discussed earlier with trusted trader and mutual recognition of import and export flows, we're getting on with that. In this area, there's actually a very mature construct that the ABF is now the, uh, if you like, custodian of. So over the years, going right back to the Customs Service on the one hand and the ADF on the other hand, going back the best part of, in fact, over two decades, there has been a permanently embedded uh, serving Rear Admiral of the Royal Australian Navy, who actually headed up uh, initially a function known as Coast Watch. Over the years, that's evolved into what is today Maritime Border Command, still head, headed up by a uh, serving uh, Admiral. Uh, not only do you get the officer, but you get true interoperability and, and interconnectivity with defence. So you reach into, into the big defence system, which uh, a number of us who have served in that portfolio know very well. So we we know what level of service we're getting and we know what other capabilities are potentially available to us. And that includes, uh, that even goes to questions like security clearances and access to certain high-end systems that I won't mention in any detail in the public forum. But that in, entire uh, armoury of national and indeed globally available assets, uh, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance uh, assets are available uh, to the Admiral, uh, who serves under the Deputy Commissioner for Operations, to engage in that risk-based operational planning. Uh, and rather than having silos, and we've, we've burst through this organisational problem many, many years ago, where you know, fisheries is concerned, so they have to deploy some assets versus those who are maybe patrolling around oil and gas infrastructure. For many years, we've had a very mature construct that says the Navy operating together with what was formerly known as the Customs Marine Unit, now the ABF Marine Force, come together to, to create a single construct. We have a true Coast Guard, a virtual Coast Guard, that is truly an amalgam of ADF capacity, because I shouldn't exclude the RAF's contribution in terms of its uh, aviation assets, and indeed the Army with uh, regional force surveillance along the coastal uh, littoral uh, of Northern Australia. So the entire joint capability of the ADF is able to be combined with the maritime elements of the ABF, and the Admiral who heads up that unified force is both the serving defence force officer with all of the powers that flow through the Defence Act and can deploy assets um, through the chain of command in the normal course, but is also a serving assistant commissioner of the Australian Border Force to ensure that all of the law enforcement requirements that he, uh, and the war being men, uh, that he has to um, undertake as part of his role flow naturally through the migration, customs, maritime powers and other acts. So we have a very seamless C2 construct. We have a very seamless organisational construct. We've got a truly joint force, uh, which is Army, Navy, Air Force and and ABF. And sitting behind that is the full armoury of Australia's intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance system. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, please take Mike Pizzullo and John Coyne.